Okay, so welcome to this first video in the playlist on calcium signalling. Now, in this video what I want to do is give a basic introduction to the ideas underlying calcium signalling and also to uh, explain the difference between a calcium channel and a calcium pump. So that's the main uh, topic for this video, calcium channels versus pumps. So calcium channels versus what's a calcium pump. Okay, right, but before I do uh, dive into the difference between a calcium channel and a calcium pump, uh, what I want to do is just give a little bit of an introduction. Okay, so let's say we have a, a cell here. What happens is that the extracellular concentration of the ion calcium, so calcium is a divalent cation, I suppose I should start off with that. Uh, calcium is an element, basically. It is an atom. Uh, which often forms ions. So calcium is in group 2 of the periodic table, uh, which means that it's an alkaloid earth metal. So I'll just write that down. It's an alkaloid earth metal. And like magnesium and uh, beryllium and other alkaloid earth metals, it has two outer shell electrons, uh, and it likes to donate those two outer shell electrons to other uh, species, basically, to other chemical species. Okay, and then with the result that it gains a positive charge because it's given away two electrons, and this results in it becoming a plus two positively charged, which means that it has effectively got, um, it's lost two negative charges, which is why it's got now two more protons than it has electrons, because it didn't lose any of its protons. If it loses any of its protons, its atomic number goes down and it's no longer called a calcium ion, a uh, calcium atom, rather. Uh, but it, came, it kept the same number of protons and lost its outer two electrons, and that caused it to become a divalent cation. Okay, so that's what calcium is, and basically, in the usual um, plasma fluid or the extracellular fluid, calcium concentration is very, very high. It's usually around 1.5 millimolar in concentration, which means that if you took uh, a litre of um, a litre of um, extracellular fluid. So a litre is basically uh, 10 centimetres by 10 centimetres by 10 centimetres. So let me draw a cube. And you can imagine that this cube is 10 centimetres by 10 centimetres by 10 centimetres. It would be a bit of a waste of paper to actually draw a 10 centimetre by 10 centimetre by 10 centimetre cube. But here's our cube. Let me just finish it off now. So there is it going back there. And basically, if this cube... Um, let me just pull this out. If this cube was actually 10 centimetres along here, at 10 centimetres along here, and then 10 centimetres finally going backwards, then that would ha would the volume of that cube would be one litre. Okay. Uh, so often another name for a litre is a decimeter cubed. You often see people refer to a litre as one decimeter cubed. And the reason is that 10 centimetres is often known as one decimeter. So all of these side lengths would be one decimeter, and therefore the cube that they span would be a decimeter cubed. Now, the unit molar, if you ever, uh, often people refer to molars uh, as concentrations. What that means is it means number of moles. So one, mol one molar means that you have one mole in a decimeter cubed, in a litre, basically. So molar means, one, one molar is one mole of that substance in a decimeter cubed. So if you've got 1.5 millimolar, what that means is that you have 1.5 millimoles, which means a thousandth of a mole, in a litre. So if you actually got a litre of extracellular fluid, the number of moles in, uh, in that litre would be 1.5 millimoles. Now, what, in, just in case you don't know what a mole is, a mole is basically just a number of molecules. So one mole of, uh, let's say, calcium means that you have um, 6.022 times 10 to the 23 
actual species, basically. So if you've got one mole of calcium ions, it means that you have, oh, sorry, 23, not just three. Uh, it means that you have this number, this massive great number of actual ions. So if you've got 1.5 millimolar, what you could do is you could actually work out how many calcium ions that means you have in a litre. So all you'd have to do is a millimole is a thousandth of this. You divide that by a thousandth to get a millimole. And then if you wanted to turn it into 1.5 millimoles, you'd then times that by 1.5, and you'd get the number of calcium ions actually in a litre. So that great big number that a mole is, is known as the Avogadrian constant. Just a little bit of a reminder of basic chemistry here. Okay, so Avogadrian constant. Right, okay. However, calcium level within the cytoplasm the concentration of calcium within the cytoplasm is much, much lower than the extracellular concentration. The concentration of calcium in the cytoplasm is kept at around 100 nanomolar. So that is much smaller. A nanomolar means that you have to, instead of dividing this by a thousand, uh, you have to divide it by a billion, basically. So a nanomolar is a billionth of a mole. So you've got a hundred nanomoles in a litre of cytosol, basically. Approximately thereabout is the concentration that the intracellular calcium is kept at. Okay, so uh, if you wanted to work out how many calcium ions would actually be in a litre of intracellular fluid, uh, then you take this mole here, and you divide it by a billion this time, so if we do it do this, you take the Avogadrian constant, which is the number of calcium ions in a mole, and then you divide that by a billion, which is 10 to the power of 9, that would give you the number in a single nanomole, but we've got 100 nanomoles per decimeter cube. So we've got 100 nanomoles, which means we've got 100 nanomoles per decimeter cube. So in a decimeter cube, we've got 100 nanomoles. So then we'd have to times it by 100, and that would give us the number of calcium ions actually in a litre of, of cytosolic fluid. Okay, right. Okay, so that's just a bit of basic discussion about the difference in calcium concentration between the cytosolic and the uh, extracellular compartment. And basically, this, what, well, firstly, let's discuss why. Why does calcium need to be kept at such low levels? Well, that, that's a why questions are very, very difficult to answer, but there is a theory, uh, and this is basically when cells begun, where, long, long ago, when cells initially appeared on this planet, what was believed to happen is that these cells lived in the ocean. So let's say this is an ocean here. So we'll have a beach here, sort of like there's the beach. Uh, but cells initially emerged, we believe, in oceans. So we initially had cells in the sea. Right. Now, the sea concentration of calcium is also around 1.5 millimolar, so it's just like plasma concentration. So that's one of these little pieces of evidence in favour of us initially being sea, uh, uh, cells initially existing in seawater. So effectively, your, your body consists of a lot of cells that are effectively suspended in the very similar uh, ionic composition, water. Um, didn't say that right. Uh, your cells are suspended in a uh, fluid that has a very similar salt, uh, salt concentrations as seawater, basically. So that's one of the pieces of evidence in favour of uh, cells initially existing in the sea. Okay, so we believe cells initially existed in the sea, and now these calcium concentrations in this seawater are quite high. Now the problem is that cells very quickly, we, uh, we think, very early in the um, evolutionary process, started using ATP as their energy currency, basically. So ATP was used as the energy currency. And let me just remind you of the, um, let me just remind you of the structure of ATP. Okay, so ATP consists of uh, the ribose sugar here, so I'll draw that as the little pentagon. So here's ribose. Then you have, off the side, you have adenine, which is the organic base. And then off the fifth carbon up here, you then have three phosphate groups, which is why it's adenosine triphosphate. So adenosine refers to the ribose bonded to the adenine, and the triphosphate re refers to the three phosphate groups here. Let me just highlight things in. So these are the phosphate groups here. Okay, and that's the triphosphate in the name there. 
And then the adenosine at the beginning here refers to the uh, ribose sugar with the adenine group here. Right, okay. Uh, now, if uh, the way the energy within the ATP molecule is released is that you hydrolyze it to ADP and an inorganic phosphate. So here is ADP, uh, which is basically adenosine again, but now only with uh, two phosphate groups. So it's adenosine diphosphate, okay? So this is adenosine diphosphate. And then obviously a single phosphate group comes off. So that it, you break uh, adenosine triphosphate uh, down, basically, into uh, two phosphate... Uh, well, you break a single phosphate group off. This third phosphate group gets broken off. And you get adenosine diphosphate and that single phosphate group. And basically, uh, that means that if you're going to use this reaction to store energy, and I should should say that when you do this reaction, this hydrolysis of ATP, it releases energy as well. So I'll put some sort of sparks in over here on this side to show that you've got some energy. Okay. Um, so if you're going to use this reaction as your store of energy and then this as your release of energy, basically, uh, you're going to have to have a high concentration of phosphate atoms, uh, for, well, phosphorus species, uh, phosphate groups uh, within your cytoplasm. And there's a problem there. If calcium levels were allowed to be in the cytoplasm the same as they are in the, um, in the seawater, i.e. 1.5 millimolar, then calcium would basically form a precipitate with phosphate groups. So calcium likes to bind with phosphate groups. So let's say here is the calcium ion. And now I'll draw out the structure of a whole phosphate group. So the structure of a phosphate group is that you have phosphorus atom bonded, double bonded to oxygen, then you have it singly bonded to a negative, an oxygen with a negative charge on, and then two hydroxyl groups like this. So phosphorus groups, which initially I just drew as this pink sort of blob, they have, uh, phosphate groups rather, they have a negative charge, and they interact with calcium very nicely, and they form calcium phosphate, basically. So usually what will happen is that uh, this calcium will get surrounded by multiple phosphorus atom, uh, phosphorus group, phosphate groups, and uh, it'll form a nice big lattice, okay, with uh, phosphate groups uh, bound uh, electrostatically to other calcium ions, and it'll form a large lattice, and that's known as calcium phosphate, okay. And basically, calcium phosphate precipitates out of solution, so it forms a solid, um, like salt, basically, like a, it forms a crystal. And so you're going to get crystals forming within your cell, and that's not what you want. Uh, that's going to kill the cell, basically. The cell is going to fill up with crystals, and it's useless. So, uh, once, and of course, once the phosphate groups are involved in this calcium, then they can't be involved in this, because obviously once you've uh, hydrolyzed your ATP to ADP, you need to then use respiration or maybe photosynthesis or something. You need to then take the ADP and the inorganic phosphate back to ATP to regenerate your energy currency, okay? So this would probably be photosynthesis or respiration. Photosynthesis. Uh, maybe initially, obviously, in the initial cells, um, photosynthesis would have been used, and then later respiration. Okay, uh, so uh, if your phosphate groups have formed this precipitate with calcium ions, then it's useless. You can't rebind them to ADP. So that's one theory of why calcium had to be kept much lower in the cytoplasm than in the extracellular space.